Or if you uh, could um, get to some of those questions. Okay, without further ado, my f I'm so excited about this. I haven't even heard of his lecture yet. I just saw some of the slides. This is one of the most important subjects, and I think every legislator in the state of Minnesota needs to hear a discussion about this. This is called nullification, the rightful remedy by the state. Without further ado, let's welcome our constitutional expert, Dave Bennett. Howdy. All right. So this is my favorite area of discussion. This is my favorite thing to speak upon, particularly because it's so subversive. And I've made it known that I'm no stranger to such topics. I'm not fearing that I'm going to tread any, you know, unfathomable ground here. But I'd like to talk about nullification as a rightful remedy. Those are the quote, that's a quote of Thomas Jefferson's because in Jefferson's mind, nullification was the rightful remedy to the state being the federal government, assuming undelegated powers that weren't enumerated in the Constitution. Uh, you see, the constitutional crisis unfolded in 1798, which would literally rattle and shake the very foundations of the young republic. And people like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison believed that this was really a calamity. It really was a monarchical tendency, which was what the Republic was supposed to refute completely. So with that said, um, the situation that would unfold in 1798 was one that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison uh, would oppose by the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, this situation as it unfolded was one that Thomas Jefferson likened to being a reign of witches, which he wrote in a letter to John Taylor of Caroline describing the incident. Well, I've told you why I told you that it's a constitutional crisis, but I want to tell you why. And the simple reason why was the passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. Now, the Alien and Sedition Acts were a group of four acts passed by the Federalist government and signed by the pen of John Adams. Uh, these acts, the most co controversial of which uh, was the Sedition Act, and the Sedition Act would charge and convict individuals that so much as said a negative comment about the President of the United States or members of Congress. Uh, people that met the criteria to be convicted under the Sedition Act could spend as much as two years time in jail and be fined as much as $1,000, which today would be approximately $23,000. I looked at that in an inflation calculator. Now, this really was, in Jefferson and Madison's mind, a calamity that likened the new government to that of a monarchy, one of a king, one of a king's royal courts that did nothing to refute such convictions. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about some of the convictions that were done under this act. Uh, in one case, David Brown erected a sign that said, no stamp act, no sedition act, no alien bills, no land tax, downfall to the tyrants of America, peace and retirement to the president, long live the vice president. Thomas Jefferson being the vice president at the time. For that, he was sentenced to jail for 18 months with a $4,000 bail. So if you so much as make one negative comment, you could be jailed and imprisoned. This literally happened upon our, in, in our land, in our republic that we hold sacred and sacrosanct. Um, another case, and maybe the most humorous one, and I, I don't even articulate this one the best because it still makes me chuckle to this day, I have to warn you, is that a man named Luther Baldwin in Newark, Newark, New Jersey was part of a welcoming ceremony for John Adams. You see, the president, John Adams, had visited New Jersey and was part of a welcoming ceremony, in, in which case cannons were shot off to welcome him. Well, Luther Baldwin was a man that was kind of known as a town drunk, right? And he was actually hanging out in a tavern, and one of his friends made a comment that, you know, John Adams is there and they're firing cannons. Well, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, Luther Baldwin took this opportunity to assert that he wished that they'd fire cannons through John Adams' ass. <laughs> for, for this comment, which seems humorous, but really was kind of a benign criticism of the president, one with, that we might hear every day today, he was, basically, uh, he was basically jailed and charged a fine until he could pay his, his fine. Um, the, the weirdest situation was a man in Vermont named Matthew Lyon was actually a sitting congressman at the time, 
and for his comments that John Adams had an unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and selfish avarice. For that comment, he was basically jailed under the Sedition Act, and he actually won a seat to the Sixth Congress from jail. So it's, it's just kind of an interesting situation. The tides of opposition to the Alien Sedition Acts were actually building at this time. Lyon actually was a part of uh, Jefferson's Republican faction. Well, given all of these convictions, I mean, they seem so cruel and callous and despotic today. Um, the Supreme Court and the Federalist Court, the uh, courts, took up no appeals to challenge these convictions, right? None at all. These were never challenged. The Supreme Court chose not to hear a single case. Um, because of that, that really disturbed the inner souls of Jefferson and Madison, which would respond accordingly. Now, due to the lack of adjudication and really getting these people out and allowing them to enjoy their liberty to speak their mind, which their imprisonment would be a clear impediment to the First Amendment, um, Jefferson and Madison produced a strategy to oppose it. Um, these courts would not rule on the side of Jefferson and Madison. I wanted to kind of relate current politics to Jefferson's views on the judiciary, which chose not to uphold this. I'd like to read a quote from 2012 presidential candidate Mitt Romney and what he said about the federal courts and their deciding of laws. And this is when it comes to his reaction to the, the 2008 Af Affordable Care Act, by the way, very affordable. I said that I agreed with the dissent, and the dissent made it clear that they felt it was unconstitutional, but the dissent lost. It's in the minority, and so now the Supreme Court has spoken. And while I agreed with the dissent, that's taken over by the fact that a majority of the court said it's a tax, and therefore it's a tax. They have spoken. There's no way around that, right? Jefferson said almost the exact opposite. This is Jefferson's reaction to the judgments of the federal judiciary, which he believed were acting in concert with the Federalists to just continuously convict people for exercising their liberty. You seem to consider judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions, a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one that would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. Our judges are as honest as other men, and not more so. They have with others the same passions for party, for power, for, and privilege of their core. Their power is more dangerous as they are in office for life, and is not responsible, as the other functionaries are, to the elective control. The Constitution has elected no such sim single tribunal, knowing that whatever hands confided with the corruptions of time and party, its members would become despots. Jefferson said this, actually later, when he was president, but he wrote the Kentucky, uh, the Kentucky Resolution of 1798 when he was vice president. That type of situation would just never unfold today. Now, Jefferson would later go to war with the federal judiciary. Uh, once he won election to the presidency in 1800, he, his Federalist faction actually impeached Samuel Chase, a sit sitting Supreme Court justice at the time, the first and only conviction of a Supreme Court justice in American history. Um, but Jefferson and Madison got together and described their strategy for opposition to these bills, because they recognized that the government didn't have this power. The Constitution does not give the government the power to convict people on these premises. They very much realized that they, they made Tenth Amendment arguments in this, on this, and they saw it as in relation to the First Amendment. Um, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions were penned in private by Jefferson and Madison. Sometimes it's asserted that they, were, they did this because they believed their actions to be treasonous. That's hogwash. The reason that they did this because they, was that they feared uh, conviction under the Alien and Sedition Acts, under the Sedition Act. So once they wrote these particular documents, which I recommend everyone read, they're of the utmost importance in constitutional thought, um, they were adopted by the home legislatures of Kentucky and Virginia, which essentially made the Sedition Act not enforceable within those two boundaries of those two states. Jefferson wrote this in the Kentucky Resolute, Resolution of 1798, that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to their general government, but that under a compact, under the style and title of the Constitution for the United States, and of the amendments thereto, they constituted a general government for specific purposes, 
delegated to that government certain definite rights, reserving to each state itself the residuary mass of the right to their own self-government. The most important part to me about the Kentucky Resolution of 1798 is the following statement. Jefferson affirmed that the government can't realize undelegated powers that aren't listed in Article 1, Section 8. Jefferson said that, and whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its actions are unauthoritative, uh, void, and without force. Uh, because of this, once the Kentucky legislature allowed this act to pass, basically, they didn't enforce the Sedition Act within its borders, realizing that this is a clearly unconstitutional action. Jefferson did not wait for the Supreme Court to weigh in to make these, these types of decisions. Um, Jefferson also wrote, a change by the people would be the constitutional remedy, but where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. So Jefferson believed that this is entirely constitutional, that the states, as parties to the Constitution, remember the states gave the federal government their authority, and under Article 7, nine states had to ratify the Constitution for it to be legally binding on any of the states. Um, like I mentioned, Jefferson clearly believed that this was the right course of action for the states to oppose the will of the federal government. Now, James Madison wrote a similar declaration, the Virginia Resolution of 1798. It was similar in context, realizing that, indeed, the United States was a compact to which the states were parties, and as such, the states have the ultimate authority of determining the constitutionality of law. Uh, James Madison wrote that this assembly explicitly and preemptorily declare that it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are parties as limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument con constituting the compact. As no farther valid they are authorized by the grants of enumerated in powers in that compact. Madison took nullification a step further in this document by saying that it was a responsibility of the states to actually oppose unconstitutional law. It wasn't the states you know, could really just decide any time they wanted to nullify an act. James Madison thought it was necessary that they were duty bound to do so, saying that in the case of deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact, the states who are parties thereto have a right, and they are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. Now, these two resolutions form the basis of thought when it comes to what some people refer to now, or referred to then, I should more say, because very rarely do people refer to these principles today, but they were referred to as the principles of 98, and these principles lived on for many decades after the original nullification acts of Kentucky and Virginia. They're used for decades after that. In fact, some of the northern states use them to nullify some aspects of the 1850 fugitive slave laws. Um, because of that, um, South Carolina actually used as its, one of its justifications and its resolution that justified secession that one of the reasons for which it was doing so was because states like Wisconsin had nullified the fugitive slave laws of 1850. Today, a strategy to oppose nullification is to associate it with deplorable acts like slavery, but uh, as such, it was never used to kind of guard slavery and protect slave power at all because there were no federal measures that prevented slavery. In fact, the federal government was actually fairly complicit with slavery through some of its actions and the doctrine of popular sovereignty as espoused by Stephen Douglas and others. So that's one of the strategies that we hear to refute that. Um, various other states, including Massachusetts and Connecticut, use nullification to nullify mandates for a draft. These principles lived on time and time again. So with that said, I just wanted to recognize that in a time such as this, where it is my estimation that we cannot allow the ultimate juggernaut of the federal government to fix itself, the sovereign bodies of the states have to exert some sort of influence, some sort, sort of steadfastness in opposing such measures. So saying that, I really appreciate you listening. Um, my only recommendation is to please share these things with others. I'd love to talk with people more about this if they're interested, and it's my favorite matter. So thank you very much for your time. What's up, Dave? So Dave's got a reading list, too, and you're going to...
see a slide that puts all of them together. Uh, Craig's going to cover that later in his segment. Uh, but this is a reading list that Dave recommends. If you go to the next slide, this is Dave's Twitter handle. Take the reading list around the table. Oh, the reading lists are also on the tables, too. So um, That's his Twitter handle, and he says this is his uh, mentality towards government. <laughs> Crush it, son. Okay. 